Michael Cohen is now poised to become the star witness against his former boss, capping his remarkable arc from the longtime lawyer who once said he'd take a bullet for Trump to implicating him in a crime. As prosecutors in Manhattan are expected to allege that Trump falsified documents in a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. Cohen explained the payment in his 2019 congressional testimony. In 2016, prior to the election, I was contacted by Keith Davidson, who is the attorney, or was the attorney, for Ms. Clifford, for Stormy Daniels. And after several rounds of conversations with him about purchasing her life rights for $130,000, what I did each and every time is go straight into Mr. Trump's office and discuss the issue with him. When it was ultimately determined, and this was days before the election, that Mr. Trump was going to pay the $130,000. In the office with me was Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization. He acknowledged to Alan that he was going to pay the 130000 and that Alan and I should go back to his office and figure out how to do it. Michael Cohen is the only person who has faced any accountability for that so-called catch-and-kill scheme. He went to prison for his role. Federal prosecutors in New York infamously noted Cohen himself has now admitted he acted in coordination with and at the direction of Individual One. Well, Individual One is expected to be arraigned in a Manhattan court on Tuesday. And joining me now is Michael Cohen, former Trump personal attorney, principal of Crisis X, and host of the Political Beatdown and Mia Culpa podcast. His new book is called Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the U.S. Department of Justice Against His Critics. Michael Cohen, thank you, as always, for being here. I always appreciate Enjoy. you coming on. Good to see you. So let, let's start with that. The, the testimony that you gave is about this catch-and-kill scheme. We know, and we just talked in the previous uh, block, about AMI, the company that American media, um, admitting to the SEC that this catch and kill scheme existed for Karen McDougal, that it existed and that it was designed to help Trump's campaign. And now I just want to play for you some audio of you talking with Donald Trump and Alan Weisselberg about that scheme. Take a look. Listen. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David. I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you. So. Don't pay for okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> So I, I guess what Joe Tacopino is trying to sort of allege is that that whole scheme was your idea, that you did it on your own, <laughs> um, and that Donald Trump had nothing to do with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what else is he supposed to say? You know, one of the biggest problems with somebody like Joe Tacopino when you get around Donald Trump is Donald will let you run with the ball because he knows you're going to he, he knows you're going to fumble it. And he's not going to be there to help you to try to pick it up. He's just going to get rid of you, which is, I, I mean, how many times have we seen that happen in Trump world before? Tacopino's biggest problem is that he has no knowledge of any of the facts. He basically comes out onto television, and he's getting quite a, a lot of airtime, and he's spewing nonsense. But the nonsense that he's spewing is nonsense that Donald Trump is telling him, this is what I want you to say. So he doesn't really care if you, Joy, believe what he's saying or any of your viewers believe, as long as he's appealing to a party of one. And that party one happens to be individual number one, who we all know is Donald J. Trump. You know, what's interesting is that, to your point, um, Donald Trump's attorneys were blindsided by this announcement to the point where Donald Trump was actually praising the grand jury and saying, look, I have new respect for this grand jury. They're not going to indict me at all. And the obviously the AG's office was very stealthy about making sure that they had no idea that it was coming, even though he previously predicted he was going to get indicted. Do you think that he was genuinely shocked and really believed that he'd beaten it? Yeah, because, again, Donald lives in Donald's head. And the fact that you had people like Takapina and you had people like Bob Costello and you had a whole slew of other pundits on this station as well as other stations telling you that when, for example, Bob Costello um, went in to testify, all of a sudden 
he's now impeached my credibility. Well, obviously, we know that that's not true. In fact, nothing that he said clearly changed anybody's mind. However, they have the same thing with Takapina. He comes out there and he says, well, after Donald, of course, puts it out there that he's going to get indicted last Tuesday, rakes in another two and a half million dollars uh, in campaign donations. And then you have guys like Takapina running around and saying there's more than a 50-50 chance that Alvin Bragg is going to drop this case altogether, that Michael Cohen's testimony has now been um, basically disparaged to the extent that there is no more case and more than 50 percent likely that Alvin Bragg is going to drop the case. They do this because they think that by playing, you know, the media game, that they're appealing to the court of public opinion, that that has any bearing on a court of law. And we all know that it doesn't. You know, um, Donald Trump is now bragging that he's raised something like $4 million. He's trying to—he's sort of out there with a lot of bravado, as if he's not afraid at all. But we now know that this is going to be a real booking. He's going to get his fingerprints taken. He's going to go through what you had to go through. He's no, going to not, go through not exactly, Park not exactly the same. Not exactly the same. And, well, it's going to be very different. I mean, he is the former president of the United States, and there's a certain yeah. deference. You know, I was handcuffed. Um, don't forget, I went through that processing twice, second time with the unconstitutional remand that's, you know, the court uh, over at the uh, 500 Pearl Street decided that it was important not only that I should be handcuffed, but shackled as well. I mean, it's amazing that I could be handcuffed, shackled. I mean, why don't they just put me in an outfit like Hannibal Lecter, simply because the president got his pecker pulled by a porn star? And I'm not referring to David Pecker either. Wow. And so you're, it, it, well, that is an excellent point, because I think there is this sense that it used to be your job to help Donald Trump maintain this impunity, right? And he's never really had to face the music, really, for the things that he's done. But to your point, he was able to use his Justice Department, it was who prosecuted you. So he's been able to manipulate prosecutors to get his way, and now he can't. You know this man. Do you think he's genuinely afraid? Because, as you said, it won't be the same, but he's still going to face a version of what regular people have to deal with. Yeah, it goes way beyond scared uh, or way beyond afraid. He's petrified. He could put on whatever fake bravado that he wants. Knowing Donald Trump, as we all do, who is not just forget about the fact he's a germaphobe. Uh, and so the fact that he's even going to be in this area is going to sort of make his skin crawl. At the same time, He's now being held accountable. And I think Neil Katyal turned around and said it. It's the first time in his life that the guy is actually being held accountable for his own dirty deeds. And look, our district attorney, Alvin Bragg, dropped a 2,000 pound dirty deed indictment right onto this guy's lap of accountability. And it's not something that he knows how to deal with. And he's really looking for somebody to figure out how to get rid of that, you know, 2,000 pound weight of accountability that's sitting on his legs. And it's just not possible. Now he has to, every time he closes his eyes, he knows that he's one minute, one hour, one day closer to having to go into, you know, the 80 Center Street and to be processed. You know, um, Donald Trump has a whole cadre of political figures who are really violating the Constitution to try to defend him, making all sorts of threatening noises at of a district attorney. Um, but you testified, uh, and I will never forget this testimony, about the fact that Donald Trump would never leave office peacefully, that there would never be a peaceful transfer of power. That did happen. Knowing him again as you do, how concerned should we be, quite frankly, um, given what happened on January 6th and given the rhetoric that's coming out of his truth social pretend Twitter, how concerned should we be about the security of this DA, the security of our country and the courthouse, um, and really places around the country where there are Trump supporters who might be pretty angry on Tuesday? <laughs> well, you know, Joy, I, I appreciate um, what you're saying. The only problem is that everybody seems to leave out that there are a whole slew of witnesses like myself that are going to be testifying against Donald. And what Donald, you know, look, I, I appreciate the issue that is now confronting the district attorney. But, you know, he's got police security around him all the time. There's a whole slew of witnesses that will be brought in. And what Donald Trump is doing is he's using that mob language, that mob code of that speech where he doesn't really say it. But what he's doing is he's 
sending two messages. The first message is, you witness, you need to be concerned because I have a slew of millions of people that I'm speaking to. And then, of course, the second half of that code goes to those individuals for them to do or think that this is what Donald Trump wants you to do without Donald Trump actually coming out and saying it. And that's part of his superpower. Yeah. Uh, and are you concerned for your safety? I'm concerned for my safety every day. I'm concerned for my family. I'm concerned for my friends. I'm concerned for this country. Do I think, for example, that any of these Trump acolytes are uh, going to pull another January 6th uh, issue and an insurrection uh, here in New York? Absolutely not. Anybody that's been to New York or knows New York, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker, our NYPD is better than most armies. And I can tell you, they don't play. And you could bet your bottom dollar that they're already fully apprised of all the situations they have, all sorts of contingencies in play. And the first time these guys decide to get stupid, it's not going to end well for them. Uh, we will be watching. And Michael Cohen, uh, always appreciated. Uh, stay safe and thank you very much for being here. Uh, Michael Cohen, you. author. Cheers, author of Revenge and the host of the Political Beatdown and Mea Culpa podcast. Thank you very much. Appreciate you.